All right, guys, welcome to chapter three, lecture one. This lecture is based solely on chemical reactions and balancing. And we're gonna really focus on the types of reactions that you need to know to be successful in AP Chem. So to start, we're just gonna review chemical equations. Chemical equations are concise representations of chemical reactions. Typically, we see the coefficients and the subscripts being used to represent moles and molecules. These chemical equations represent chemical changes. So remember, a chemical change is when we reorganize atoms to form something new. When we look at these chemical reactions, it's important to know that when we break the bonds, such as breaking the bond of let's say this H2 that requires energy. When we form new bonds, we release energy. Okay, so it's important to remember the chemical reaction transforms elements and compounds into new substances, but we do have to put energy in. The important thing to also remember is to balance your chemical equation because this gives us our mole ratio that we're going to use in the next lecture when we talk about stoichiometry. So what is in a chemical equation? Well, we have the reactants on the left side of the equation and on the right side we have the products. So you have the reactants on the left, products on the right. Those should be different if it's a chemical reaction, right? Because in order for a chemical change to happen, we have to form something new. And also when we look at chemical reactions, it's very, very important to include states of matter. Every single chemical reaction that you write, you need states of matter. So you have G for gas, L for liquid, S for solid, or AQ if it's an aqueous solution. Typically an acid is aqueous solution. So remember to include your states of matter. And then like I discussed before, coefficients are extremely important when you balance your equation. Coefficients are inserted to balance the equation to follow the law of conservation of mass. Antoine Lavoisier said nothing is created. An equal amount of matter exists both before and after the experiment. When you get really difficult equations to balance, blame Lavoisier for coming up with this idea. Okay, so remember, coefficients are extremely, extremely important. Coefficients tell us the number of molecules or the number of moles, and it gives us that ratio when we do stoichiometry. Subscripts tell us the number of atoms. They are two different things. So to go along with the idea of adding coefficients instead of changing subscripts, we can look at the example of water. Hydrogen and oxygen can make water or it can make hydrogen peroxide. If you need to change the amount of oxygens to balance the equation, you should add a two in front of the water. Instead of having a single molecule or a single mole of water, we have two moles. Or you change the subscript of the oxygen. So instead of having water, you now have hydrogen peroxide. Notice that by changing the subscript, you are changing the compound altogether. That's why it's so important that you're focusing on the coefficients and you cannot add subscripts to balance the equation. So just some tips for balancing equations as you're working through. Save oxygen for the end. Oxygen can make everything very, very complicated, so just save it for the end. If the same polyatomic ion is both a reactant and a product, treat it as a single unit. In this example, treat phosphate as a single thing. On the left side of the equation, you have one PO4. On the right side, you have two PO4s. Balance it like that, that's gonna make everything much, much easier. If you get stuck, double the most complicated compound. Typically, this works when you're working with combustion reactions. If nothing is working to balance, double the hydrocarbon. That's the most complicated compound. Double that, that should help you balance. And then, this last tip is more of something that you need to know. If carbonic acid, H2CO3, is ever formed, it spontaneously decomposes into CO2 and H2O. If you ever form H2CO3, that cannot be a product. You have to break it down further into CO2 and H2O. So I want you to take just a minute or so to try this practice exercise. This is working with particle diagrams, and again, AP Chem is moving in the direction of using particle diagrams to justify or explain a certain concept. In the following diagram, you have white spheres and you have blue spheres. To be consistent with the law of conservation of mass, how many ammonia molecules should be shown? So I want you to try this on your own. See if you can answer this question and then take a look at sample exercise 3.1 in your book to see if you have the correct answer. Okay, so here are some examples of balancing equations. These are not in your notes, but I just wanted to go through some practice just to make sure that you've got the concepts. If we look at A, you are adding iron to oxygen and you're forming iron three 
or ferric oxide. So let's take a look at how we might balance this. If we look at this, look at A first, we have one iron on the left, two on the right. So to balance that, I'm gonna need to put a two on the left side. Our irons are balanced. Now let's take a look at oxygens. Okay, we have two on the left, three on the right. So in order to do this, we have an even number on the left and odd on the right. If you ever have an odd number of something, it helps to double it. So let's double what we have on the right side. Okay, that makes our oxygens an even number. Even numbers are better to work with. That changes these irons. This is why it is extremely important, extremely important to use a pencil when you're balancing because, which I don't think this is gonna let me erase. Oh, well, let's pretend I erase this. Okay, now we have four irons. Okay, four irons, that's good to go. Now we look at the oxygens. We have six over here. We need not a six, we need a three because it's O2. So your coefficient should be four, three, two. For some reason, my iPad's not letting me erase. You should have four in front of the iron, three in front of the oxygen, and two in front of the iron, three oxide. Take a second, try B and C, pause the video, and then come back, check and see if you have the right coefficients. Okay, so if you take a look at B and C, if we're looking at B, we have have a combustion reaction. We have one, three, two, two. Okay, and then in C, two, six, two, three. Again, you had an odd number with the chlorines, and so you had to double that. If you find that you need extra practice with balancing equations, look over sample exercise 3.2 in your text. That will walk you through and look at all the different solutions, but that will help with balancing. If you find that you still have some questions, feel free to send me an email. I can help you out. All right, so with chemical reactions, we're not in Kansas anymore. AP Chem typically does not give you equations to complete like you saw last year. Instead, you're gonna have to take it a step further. And what I mean by taking it a step further is you have to read. You have to read every question. I cannot stress that enough. Whether it's chemical reactions or not, you have to read. Um, you have to know what forms and when things form in AP chemical reactions. You will have to memorize, but these are examples from past AP tests. Say lithium metal is strongly heated in nitrogen gas, and then you can read through the, the other three examples. You have to know what type of reaction it is and what forms. So the first type of reaction that we're going to look at is decomposition. Now you looked at all the reaction types last year, but we're gonna kind of take it a step further. So in a decomposition reaction, one substance breaks down into two or more substances. Decomposition reactions usually have more products than reactants. So you can kind of look at that just to make sure you're on the right track. So consider the reaction that occurs in airbag in a car. There are more products than reactants. And just so you know, this is the reaction we're looking at. We're looking at sodium azide breaking down into sodium and nitrogen gas. We know it's decomposition because the sodium azide was a single reactant and it has decomposed into two substances. Okay, so that's your decomposition reaction. You have some other examples as well, but that's how you tell if it's decomposition. Now, you're not just going to simply be asked if a reaction is decomposition. Instead, you're gonna be given a reactant and you're gonna be asked to predict the products. So you have to know the specific types of decomposition reactions. For example, metallic chlorates, like KClO3, right, potassium chlorate, they decompose into the metal chloride and oxygen. Okay, so when it's heated, that's what happens. You can think about it when it's heated, okay, the triangle represents heat. When potassium chlorate is heated, it decomposes into potassium chloride and oxygen. Keep in mind why this is O2, and it's diatomic. This is one type of decomposition. You should have learned this last year. Just kind of pull that out of your brain. Another example, metallic carbonates, okay, like calcium carbonate. They decompose into the metal oxide and carbon dioxide gas. Not redox means you don't have to worry about electrons changing. The charges are going to be consistent. Calcium carbonate decomposes into calcium oxide and carbon dioxide gas. And then the third example are hydrated compounds. Keep in mind what it means to be hydrated. Hydrated means it has water attached. So the example here is copper sulfate pentahydrate. They decompose into the anhydrous compound. Anhydrous just means without water. So it decomposes into the anhydrous compound 
and water. So you're simply breaking that apart. Okay, more decomposition reactions that you need to know. Oxides of the less active metals decompose to form the metal and oxygen when heated. In this case, you have mercury oxide decomposes into mercury and oxygen gas. Acids decompose into water and non-metallic oxides. So we have phosphoric acid decomposes into diphosphorus pentaoxide and water. A way to look at this is just balance your oxygens to figure out how many of everything else you need. I know this is kind of backwards, but when you're looking at this, you know that it decomposes into phosphorus and oxygen. We don't know how many oxygens, but then we know that it has water. So if you take a look here and here, you can balance this out. So we know that we have three hydrogens on the left. Well, the only place that hydrogen is going to go is into the water. So you can actually balance these hydrogens and work backwards. So we have two here, three here. Remember, we have to double everything. So we have to put a two in front. That gives us six here. That gives us six here by putting a three in front of the water. Well, now we have two of the reactants slash products balance, that will now let us know what this non-metallic oxide is going to be. Okay? Because if we look at what's balanced here, we have two phosphoruses, so we're gonna put a two here. We have eight oxygens, but we have three in the water. That means we're gonna have five in the non-metallic oxide. So you kind of work backwards to figure out what that non-metallic oxide will be. Okay? And that's why when it says not redox, that's important because that allows us to do this method that we just walked through. Okay, then bases decompose into water and metallic oxides, or we're gonna look at the reverse in a second. So if we have calcium hydroxide, that's going to decompose into calcium oxide and water. And then peroxides decompose into oxides and oxygen. So we have potassium peroxide. Okay, it's peroxide because it's O2 and it's K2. So by balancing charges, we know that that's a peroxide. Those decompose into potassium oxide and oxygen gas. Okay, and then finally, some new decomposition. So these are probably going to be decomposition reactions that you didn't look at at all last year. But again, important to know, all of these you're gonna have to memorize. So ammonium carbonate actually decomposes into ammonia, water, and carbon dioxide. If you know that it's ammonia, okay, and you know it's ammonia, just an H3, that leaves us H and CO3. Okay, well, that leaves us H2CO3. H2CO3 decomposes into carbon dioxide and water. So kind of one way to remember that. And then ammonium hydroxide decomposes into ammonia and water. So two new decomposition reactions that you still need to know. Just kind of a note on this, um, electrolysis, which we looked at last year, is actually a little more complicated than we talked about. And we're going to do electrolysis when we talk about electrochem way later in the year. So the next type of reactions are combination or synthesis reactions. In these types of reactions, two or more substances react to form just one product. So this is the opposite of the decomposition. So combination reactions are gonna have more reactants than products. So if we consider this first reaction, okay, this magnesium and oxygen, there are fewer products okay, because the magnesium has combined to form magnesium oxide. Again, notice, in this picture, you have a particle diagram as well as the macroscopic view. Okay, macroscopic is what we see, and then the particle diagrams are what are happening at the microscopic level. Notice that the structure has changed. Magnesium consists of closely packed atoms, oxygen, it's more dispersed because it's a gas, but we're gonna form this solid. And so magnesium oxide is going to be this lattice. It's an ionic compound, so it's going to be composed of ions in a crystal lattice. Okay, so notice this is a chemical reaction because we have formed something new. So some combination or synthesis reactions that you need to know. Oxygen combines with most elements to form oxides. Magnesium and oxygen gas creates magnesium oxide. You can cross the charges. Carbon plus oxygen, just put them together right, CO2. Metals combine with non-metals to yield ionic compounds, so you crisscross the charges. Non-metals tend to combine with each other to form covalent compounds. Now, you could actually crisscross these charges for SF2, right? If you think this is minus two, this is minus one. I know that they're both negative, but that's just kind of a, a simplified way of determining 
what the covalent compound will be that will form. And then oxides of active metals combine with water to form bases. Notice this is the exact reaction just flipped of what we looked at during decomposition. Okay, and just a rule of thumb when you're looking at synthesis reactions is if there's a metal that can have multiple charges like iron, iron can be ferrous, which is plus two, or ferric, which could be plus three. If you don't remember that, look at the naming packet that I've posted online. If there is a limited amount of the metal, if your metal is your limiting reactant, the ion will have the higher charge. Okay, so if metal is limiting, it's going to have the higher charge. If the metal is excess, it's gonna have the lower charge. Just kind of a rule of thumb as you're working through synthesis reactions. So some more combination reactions that we can look at. Non-metal oxides will combine with water to form acids. Again, this is not redox. So I keep talking about redox. Redox is an abbreviation for oxidation reduction reactions. This is a process when electrons are transferred. So when I say that it's not redox, we don't have to worry about electrons moving around, which means the charges stay the same. Hey, the reason that that's so important is because in this first example, we look at sulfur trioxide and water. The nice thing about this not being redox is we can just add these together. We can just count everything up and just add them together. That forms H2SO4. The example below it, a okay, sulfur dioxide, add them together, we get H2SO3. So that's the nice thing about not having to worry about electrons being transferred. We'll talk way more about oxidation reduction um, later in the year. But then we have oxides of metals. Okay, so metallic oxides combine with non-metal oxides to make ionic compounds. Again, not redox. The nice thing about not being redox is we just add them together. Third reaction that we're going to talk about is combustion. Combustion reactions are generally very rapid that produce a flame. Most often it involves hydrocarbons reacting with air, which is just talking about oxygen. So just some examples here, we have methane, and oxygen gas, that's what happens in a Bunsen burner. Notice, again, I have given you particle diagrams. It's very, very important that you understand particle diagrams, okay? Your book looks at particle diagrams a lot as well. So we have the particle diagram here, we have methane, oxygen, gas, and it produces CO2 and H2O. If you have a hydrocarbon reacting with oxygen, you always produce CO2 and H2O. Here's another example just to see, no matter what you react with oxygen, you form CO2 and H2O. Now you might be thinking, well, what about double replacement reactions and single replacement reactions? We didn't talk about those. Well, the reason for that is we're gonna be talking about those in chapter four. Chapter four looks a lot at aqueous solutions so we're gonna be focusing on the replacement reactions in chapter four. Chapter three is just really looking at the type of reactions that you need to know for AP. Don't forget, you write the reaction, you balance the reaction, and don't forget to include states of matter. Okay? If you're not sure, just kind of think to yourself if you can think of an example. If it says aluminum, well, where's aluminum on the periodic table? It's a metal. All right, same with lithium. It's a metal. If it says forming with oxygen, oxygen, it's a gas. Think to yourself, they might not necessarily tell you specifically what the state of matter is, but just think about previous knowledge and what you know about it. Also, don't forget about diatomic molecules. So as you work through, let me know if you have questions, and then you can watch the second lecture for chapter three.